If one of the first men could enter the world of the last men, he would find many things familiar and much that would seem strangely distorted and perverse. But nearly everything that is most distinctive of the last human species would escape him. Unless he were to be told that behind all the obvious and imposing features of civilization, behind all the social organization and personal intercourse of a great community, lay a whole other world of spiritual culture, round about him, yet beyond his ken. He would no more suspect its existence than a cat in London suspects the existence of finance or literature. Among the familiar things that he would encounter would be creatures recognizably human, yet in his view grotesque. While he himself labored under the weight of his own body, these giants would be easily striding. He would consider them very sturdy, often thick-set folk, but he would be compelled to allow them grace of movement and even beauty of proportion. The longer he stayed with them, the more beauty he would see in them, and the less complacently he would regard his own type. Some of these fantastic men and women he would find covered with fur, hirsute, or mole velvet, revealing their underlying muscles. Others would display brown, yellow, or ruddy skin, and yet others a translucent ash green, warmed by the underflowing blood. As a species, though we are all human, we are extremely variable in body and mind, so variable that superficially we seem to be not one species but many. Some characters, of course, are common to all of us. The traveler might perhaps be surprised by the large yet sensitive hands which are universal both in men and women. In all of us, the outermost finger bears at its tip three minute organs of manipulation, rather similar to those which were first devised for the fifth man. These, excre these, these excrescences would doubtless revolt our visitor. The pair of occipital eyes, too, would shock him. So would the upward, upward-looking astronomical eye on the crown, which is peculiar to the last men. This organ was so cunningly designed that when fully extended, about a hand breadth from its bony case, it reveals the heavens in as much detail as your smaller astronomical telescopes. Apart from such special features as these, there is nothing definitely novel about us, though every limb, every contour, shows unmistakably that much has happened since the days of the first men. We are both more human and more animal. The primitive explorer might be more readily impressed by our anima animality than our humanity. So much of our humanity would lie beyond his grasp. He would perhaps at first regard us as a degraded type. He would call us fawn-like, and in particular cases ape-like, bear-like, ox-like, marsupial, or elephantine. Yet our general proportions are definitely human in the ancient manner. Where gravity is not insurmountable, the erect biped form is bound to be most serviceable to intelligent land animals. And so, after long wanderings, man has returned to his old shape. Moreover, if our observer were himself at all sensitive to facial expression, he would come to recognize in every one of our innumerable physiogn physi physiognomic types an indescribable yet distinctively human look, the visible sign of that inward and spiritual grace which is not wholly absent from his own species. He would perhaps say, These men that are beasts are surely gods also. He would be reminded of those old e Egyptian deities with animal heads. But in us the animal and the human interpenetrate in every feature, in every curve of the body, and with infinite variety. He would observe us, together with hints of the long-extinct Mongol, Negro, Nordic, and Semitic, many outlandish features and expressions deriving from the subhuman period on Neptune, or from Venus. He would see in every limb unfamiliar contours of muscle, sinew, or bone, which were acquired long after the first men had vanished. Besides the familiar eye colors, he would discover orbs of topaz, emerald, amethyst, and ruby, and a thousand varieties of these. But in all of us, he would see also, if he had discernment, a facial expression and bodily gesture peculiar to our own species, a certain luminous yet pungent and ironical significance, which we miss almost wholly in the earlier human faces. 
The traveler would recognize among us unmistakable sexual features, both of general proportions and special organs. But it would take him long to discover that some of the most striking bodily and facial differences were due to differentiation of the two ancient sexes into many subsexes. Full sexual experience involves for us a complicated relationship between individuals of all these types. Of the extremely important sexual groups, I shall speak again. Our visitor would notice, by the way, that though all persons on Neptune go habitually nude, save for a pouch or rucksack, clothing, often brightly color colored and made of diverse lustrous or homely tissues unknown before our time, is worn, is worn for special purposes. He would notice also, scattered about the green countryside, many buildings, mostly of one story. For there is plenty of room on Neptune, even for the million million of the last men. Here and there, however, we have great architectural pylons, cruciform or starred shape, star-shaped in section, cloud-piercing, dignifying the invariable plains of Neptune. These mightiest of all buildings, which are constructed in adamantine materials formed of artificial atoms, would seem to our visitor geometrical mountains, far taller than any natural mountain could be, even on the smallest planet. In many cases, the whole fabric is translucent or transparent, so that at night, with internal illumination, it appears as an edifice of light. Springing from a base twenty or more miles across, the star-seeking towers attain a height where even Neptune's atmosphere is somewhat attenuated. And there, in, their summit, in their summits work the host of our astronomers, the essential eyes through which our community, on her little raft, peers across the ocean. Thither also all men and women repair at one time or another to contemplate this galaxy of ours and the unnumbered, remoter universes. There they perform together those symbolic, those supreme symbolic acts for which I find no adjective in your speech but the debased word religious. There also they seek the refreshment of mountain air in a world where natural mountains are unknown. And on the pinnacles and precipices of these loftiest horns, many of us gratify that primeval lust of climbing which was ingrained in man before ever he was man. These buildings thus combine the functions of observatory, temple, sanatorium, and gymnasium. Some of them are almost as old as the species. Some are not yet com completed. They embody, therefore, many styles. The traveler would find modes which he would be tempted to call Gothic, Classical, Egyptian, Peruvian, Chinese, or American, besides a thousand architectural ideas unfamiliar to him. Each of these buildings was the work of the race as a whole at some stage in its career. None of them is a mere local product. Every successive culture has expressed itself in one or more of these supreme monuments. Once in 40,000 years or so, some new architectural glory would be conceived and executed. And such is the continuity of our cultures that there has scarcely ever been need to remove the handiwork of the past. If our visitor happened to be near enough to one of these great pylons, he would see it surrounded by a swarm of midges, which would turn out to be human flyers, wingless but with outspread arms. The stranger might wonder how a large organism could rise from the ground in Neptune's powerful field of gravity, yet flight is our ordinary means of locomotion. A man has but to put on a suit of overalls, fitted at various points with radiation generators, Ordinary flight thus becomes a kind of aerial swimming. Only when very high speed is desired do we make use of closed-in airboats and liners. At the feet of the great buildings, the flat or undulating country is green, brown, golden, and strewn with houses. Our traveler would recognize that much land was under cultivation and would see many persons at work upon it with tools or machinery. Most of our food, indeed, is produced by artificial photosynthesis on the broiling planet Jupiter, where even now that, that the sun is becoming normal again, no life can exist without powerful refrigeration. As far as mere nutrition is concerned, we could do without vegetation, but agriculture and its products have played so great a part in human history that today 
agricultural operations and vegetable foods are very beneficial to the race psychologically. And so it comes about that vegetable matter is in great demand, not only as raw material for innumerable manufacturers, but also for table delicacies. Green vegetables, fruit, and various alcoholic fruit drinks have come to have the same kind of ritual significance for us as wine has for you. Meat also, though not a part of ordinary diet, is eaten on very rare and sacred occasions. The cherished wild fauna of the planet contributes its toll to periodic symbolical banquets. And whenever a human being has chosen to die, his body is ceremoniously eaten by his friends. Communication with the food factories of Jupiter and the agricultural polar regions of the less torrid Uranus, as also with the automatic mining stations on the glacial outer planets, is maintained by ether ships, which, traveling much faster than the planets themselves, make the passage to the neighbor worlds in a small fraction of the Neptunian year. These vessels, of which the smallest are about a mile in length, may be seen descending on our oceans like ducks. Before they touch the water, they cause a prodigious tumult, tumult with the downward pressure of their radiation. But once upon the surface, they pass quietly into harbor. The ether ship is in a manner symbolic of our whole community, so highly organized is it, and so minute in relation to the void which engulfs it. The ethereal navigators, because they spend so much of their time in the empty regions beyond the range, the range of telepathic communication and sometimes even of mechanical radio, form mentally a unique class among us. They are a hardy, simple, and modest folk, and though they embody man's proud mastery of the ether, they are never tired of reminding landlubbers with dour jocularity that the most daring voyages are confined within one drop of the boundless ocean of space. Recently, an exploration ship returned from a voyage into the outer tracks. Half her crew had died. Their survivors were emaciated, diseased, and mentally unbalanced. To a race that thought itself so well-established in sanity that nothing could disturb it, the spectacle of these unfortunates was instructive. Throughout the voyage, which was, which was the longest ever attempted, they had encountered nothing whatever but two comets and an occasional meteor. Some of the nearer constellations were seen with altered forms. One or two stars increased slightly in brightness, and the sun was reduced to the most brilliant of stars. The aloof and changeless presence of the constellations seems to have crazed, crazed the voyagers. When at last the ship returned and berthed, there was a scene such as is seldom witnessed in our modern world. The crew flung open the ports and staggered, blubbering into the arms of the crowd. It would never have been believed that members of our species could be so far reduced from the self-possession that is normal to us. Subsequently, these poor human wrecks have shown an irrational phobia of the stars and of all that is not human. They dare not go out at night. They live in, a, in an extravagant passion for the presence of others. And since all others are astronomically minded, they cannot find real companionship. They insanely refuse to participate in the mental life of the race, upon the plane where all things are seen in their just proportions. They cling piteously to the sweets of individual life, and so they are led to curse the immensities. They fill their minds with human conceits and their houses with toys. By night they draw the curtains and drown the quiet voice of the stars in revelry. But it is a joyless and a haunted revelry, desired less for itself than as a defense against reality. Part 2. Childhood and Maturity I said that we were all astronomically minded, but we are not without human interests. Our visitor from the Earth would soon discover that the low buildings, sprinkled on all sides, were the homes of individuals, families, sexual groups, and bands of companions. Most of these buildings are so constructed that the roof and walls can be removed, completely or partially, for sunbathing and for the night. Round each house is a wilderness or a garden or an orchard of our sturdy fruit trees. Here and there, men and women may be seen at work with hoe or spade or secateurs. These buildings themselves affect many styles, and within doors, our visitor would find great variety from house to house. Even within a single house, he might come on rooms seemingly of different epochs, and while some rooms are crowded with articles, many of which would be incomprehensible to the stranger, Others are bare, 
save for a table, chairs, a cupboard, and perhaps some single object of pure art. We have an immense variety of manufactured goods, but the visitor from a world obsessed with material wealth would probably remark the simplicity, even austerity, which characterizes most private houses. He would doubtless be surprised to see no books. In every room, however, there is a cupboard filled with minute rolls of tape, microscopically figured. Each of these rolls contain matter which could not be cramped into a score of your volumes. They are used in connection with a pocket instrument, the size and shape of the ancient cigarette case. When the roll is inserted, it's re it reels itself off at any desired speed and interferes systematically with ethereal vibrations produced by the instrument. Thus is gener generated a very complex flow of telepathic language, which permeates the brain of the reader. So delicate and direct is this medium of expression that, that there is scarcely any possibility of misunderstanding the author's intention. The rolls themselves, it should be said, are produced by another special instrument, which is sensitive to vibrations generated in the author's brain. Not that it produces a mere replica of his stream of consciousness. It records only those images and ideas which he deliberately inscribes it, with which he deliberately inscribes it. I may mention also, since we can at any moment communicate by direct telepathy with any person on the planet, these books of ours are not used for the publication of merely ephemeral thought. Each one of them preserves only the threshed and chosen grains of some mind's harvest. Other instruments may be observed in our houses, which I cannot pause to describe, instruments whose office is either to carry out domestic drudgery or to minister directly in one way or another to cultured life. Near the outer door would be hanging a number of flying suits, and in a garage attached to the house would be the private airboats, gaily colored, torpedo-shaped objects of various sizes. Decoration in our houses, save in those which belong to children, is everywhere simple, even severe. Nonetheless, we prize it greatly and spend much consideration upon it. Children, indeed, often adorn their houses with splendor, which adults themselves can also enjoy through children's eyes, even as they can enter into the frolics of infants with unaffected glee. The number of children in our world is small in relation to our immense population. Yet, seeing that every one of us is potentially immortal, it may be wondered how we can permit ourselves to have any children at all. The explanation is twofold. In the first place, our policy is to produce new individuals of higher type than ourselves, for we are very far from biologically perfect. Consequently, we need a continuous supply of children, and as these successively reach maturity, they take over the functions of adults whose nature is less perfect, and these when they are aware that they are no longer of service, elect, elect to retire from life. But even though every individual sooner or later ceases to exist, the average length of life is not much less than a quarter of a million terrestrial years. No wonder, then, that we cannot accommodate many children. But we have more than might be expected, for with us, infancy and adolescence are very lengthy. The fetus is carried for 20 years. Ectogenesis was practiced by our predecessors, but was abandoned by our own species, because with greatly improved motherhood there is no need for it. Our mothers, indeed, are both physically and mentally most vigorous during the all-too-rare rare period of pregnancy. After birth, true infancy lasts about a century. During this period in which the foundations of body and mind are being laid very slowly, but so securely that they will never fail, the individual is cared for by his mother. Then follow some centuries of childhood and a thousand years of adolescence. Our children, of course, are very different beings from the children of the first men. Though physically they are in many respects still childlike, they are independent persons in the community. Each has either a house of his own or rooms in a larger building held in common by himself and his friends. Thousands of these are to be found in the neighborhood of every educational center. There are some children who pr prefer to live with their parents or with one or other of their parents, but this is rare, though there is often much friendly intercourse between parents and children. The generations usually fare better under separate roofs. This is inevitable in our species, for the adult's overwhelmingly greater experience reveals the world to him in very different proportions from those which alone are possible even to the most brilliant of children, of children. while on the other hand, with us, the mind of every child 
is, in some potentiality or other, definitely superior to every adult mind. Consequently, while the child can never appreciate what is best in his elders, the adult, in spite of his power of direct insight into all minds not superior to himself, is doomed to incomprehension of all that is novel in his own offspring. Six or seven hundred years after birth, a child is in some respects physically equivalent to a ten-year-old of the first man. But since his brain is destined for much higher development, it is already far more complex than any adult brain of that species. And though temperamentally, he is in many ways still a child. Intellectually, he, already, he has already in some respects passed beyond the culture of the best adult minds of the ancient races. The traveler, encountering one of our bright boys, might sometimes be reminded of the wise simplicity of the legendary child Christ, but also he might equally well discover a vast exuberance, boisterousness, impishness, and a complete inability to stand outside the child's own eager life and regard it dispassionately. In general, our children develop intellectually beyond the level of the first men long before they begin to develop the dispassionate will, which is characteristic of our adults. When there is conflict between a child's personal needs and the needs of society, he will, as a rule, force himself to the social course. But he does so with resentment and dramatic self-pity, thereby rendering himself, in the adult view, exquisitely ridiculous. When our children attain physical adolescence, nearly a thousand years after birth, they leave the safe paths of childhood to spend another thousand years in one of the Antarctic continents, known as the Land of the Young. Somewhat reminiscent of the wild continent of the fifth men, this territory is preserved as virgin is preserved as virgin bush and prairie. Subhuman grazers and carnivora abound. Volcanic eruption, hurricanes, and glacial seasons afford further attractions to the adventurous young. There is consequently a high death rate. In this land, our young people live the half primitive, half sophisticated life to which their nature is fitted. They hunt, fish, tend cattle, and till the ground. They cultivate all the simple beauties of human individuality. They love and hate. They sing, paint, and carve. They devise heroic myths and delight in fantasies of direct intercourse with a cosmic person. They organize themselves as tribes and nations. Sometimes they even indulge in warfare of a primitive but bloody type. Formerly when this happened, the adult world interfered but we have since learned to let the fever run its course. The loss of life is regrettable, but it is a small price to pay for the insight afforded even by this restricted and juvenile warfare into those primitive agonies and passions, which, when they are experienced by the adult mind, are so transformed by philosophy that their import is wholly changed. In the land of the young, our boys and girls experience all that is precious and all that is abject in the primitive. They live through in their own persons, century by century, all its toilsomeness and cramped meanness, all its blind cruelty and precariousness, but also they taste its glamour, its vernal and lyrical glory. They make in little all the mistakes of thought and action that men have ever made, but at last they emerge ready for the larger and more difficult world of maturity. It was expected that some day, when we should have perfected the species, there would be no need to build up successive generations, no need of children, no need of all the schooling. It was expected that the community would then consist of adults only, and that they would be immortal, not merely potentially, but in fact, yet also, of course, perennially in the flower of young maturity. Thus, death, that death should never cut the string of individuality and scatter the hard-won, hard-won pearls necessitating new strings and laborious regatherings. The many and very delectable beauties of childhood could still be amply enjoyed in the exploration of the past. We now know that this goal is not to be attained, since man's end is imminent.